Welcome to 2022 and welcome to RM Transit. If you're new here, it's a bit of a running joke that I love automated metros, especially light automated metros. The Montreal Rem, the Copenhagen Metro, the Vancouver Skytrain, for example. Especially the Vancouver Skytrain, people like to say. I'm going to propose in this video that that's for good reason. Different transit modes serve different roles, and automated light metros serve a role that didn't necessarily have a transit mode that served well for the longest time. Let's dive in and see why I'm actually not crazy and automated light metro is very cool. If you like Arm Transit and want to stay in touch with everything I'm doing, consider following me on Twitter and Instagram for all the latest updates and hot takes. Now, before I get into the video, I want to mention that, as you can see, I have expanded my wall art uh, with some art pieces sent over for free by All Things Transport. And look, there's now a Sydney Metro one, a Link Light Rail one, and a REM one. I may have had something to do with these options appearing. Uh, but they are fantastic prints. They're a good size. They look really nice on your wall. You can check out the link uh, to the Etsy store down below to help support all things transport. Just a warning, I'm probably going to refer to light metro and automated light metro pretty interchangeably in this video. So I'm just putting that out there. You don't need to comment. At this point, I think it's worth addressing. I, and actually a lot of others, are constantly on Twitter and in other places suggesting that different cities give light metro a try. And the suggestion or assumption made by a lot of people is that I'm just sort of fanatical about light metro growing up in Vancouver. I want to replicate that in every city. And that's really not the case. In fact, I'm not even that big of a fan of the way that automated light metro trains that we have today necessarily look. I didn't mention any automated light metro trains in my recent top five metro trains video. So what is it then? Why is the solution to all of our transit problems in North America automated light metro? Well, it isn't, but automated light metro is the solution for so many of the problems we haven't had clear solutions to, and it's incredibly versatile, uh, much like another transit mode that I'm slightly less a fan of. Now, when a city or region is investing in transit, there are some key things that make that investment attractive and that help drive economic activity and make transit good. Now, of course, transit has the ability to do so many fantastic things for a city, make it a better place to live, make it a more attractive place to live, and make it a more affordable place to live. But I believe that the sort of first principles of making good transit that enables these other things are these fundamentals. The ability to improve travel time, the ability to move a large capacity of people, and the ability to do so at a low cost. Now, one of the issues we've seen traditionally, especially in North American suburbs, but in other places around the world as well, is that in areas where transit demand is at least seen as low, you get low quality solutions that significantly sacrifice some of these core elements in order to deliver an affordable transit service. Uh, what I'd argue though, is that an affordable transit service is actually not necessarily that affordable since you may not be spending much money, but you're also just basically burning your money because it's not helping a ton of people get to where they need to go effectively. Basically, a lot of the time when we serve low density areas, we do it with slow, infrequent, low quality transit, and it's often not cheap to implement. Sometimes that's local buses with, if you're lucky, a fancy livery and a nice stop. Sometimes it's light rail. A lot of these projects often feel like, and sometimes are just straight up, excuses to spend money because otherwise funding will go somewhere else. And of course, if there's truly no better option, then let's build the transit we can build. But I think we need to consider more options before immediately jumping to, let's put in a BRT light system, or let's lay down a light rail line on this suburban corridor. And part of the issue here is that I actually believe that choosing the wrong mode or building the wrong transit project in the wrong place isn't just wasteful, but it's actually actively negative. And I'm going to explain why. When you invest in a certain transit route or project, you have to be committed to it to ensure it's successful. If you have a transit project or line that people are worried might get its service cut back or might not get continual investment, they're not gonna build their whole lives around it. They're not gonna buy a house based on it or an apartment or a condo, and they're not 
going to choose their job based on where they can get on transit. And this is a fundamental problem when you're trying to drive ridership. I'd argue that places that are constantly cutting and reinstating transit service often see lower ridership. And some places in the world that struggle to get high transit ridership, despite actually building a lot of transit, well, they probably suffer from this problem of constantly cutting service and reinstating it. Imagine if you were driving and your speed limits constantly were being cut in half it would make driving a pretty inconvenient process. And that's what it's like when you have transit service constantly being cut. Now, along with commitment to a transit project or a transit route, you have to realize that commitment comes with spending money. That is essentially what commitment is in this case. And if you have an expensive transit route or transit project, it's harder to remain committed to it because there are competing priorities for any transit agency. Now, I actually did a video about half a year ago about why you might want to consider replacing heavier forms of transit like full metro projects with lighter forms of metro. And this is not that video. This video is more about how we can use light metro technology to improve suburban and low density transit. But it's worth checking that one out if you're interested in more of the applications of light metro. This is really a case though where I'm saying we shouldn't step our mode down, we should step our mode up. Now, as I mentioned before, our solutions to transit unfriendly areas, low density areas have often been slow, infrequent and expensive. But anyone can tell you at this point that speed and frequency are like the most critical elements of creating a successful transit network. If you don't have high frequency, no one is going to rely on your transit. Of course, you also can't build things that you can't pay for. And so while large suburban rail or S-Bahn networks in North America seem like a great option, if the rail corridors that we would have used for them are long abandoned or if they've been built up, then they become a lot less attractive as options. Something that's kind of interesting is contrasting Australia, which has a lot of the low density and sprawl of North America, but has these legacy passenger railway networks that developed along with it, that mean Australia doesn't have as much of a high speed suburban transit problem as we face in North America, where a lot of the interurbans and other suburban rail services are simply gone. Now, Australia would probably be in the same boat as Canada, the United States, and other places if it wasn't for the fact that they kept their passenger rail corridors, but now they have them and we don't. So we have to think about different solutions because let's be honest, rebuilding large scale passenger rail corridors designed around large traditional trains isn't always practical. You have to build big stations and a lot of significant infrastructure and that does not come cheap, especially in 21st century North America. Now, a lot of cities have turned to light rail, but the truth is light rail isn't a really good solution for low density or suburban areas. Now, it usually has low speeds because we don't have a high quality right of way. If you have a high quality right of way, you might as well take the Australian approach and use larger trains. At the same time though, light rail tends to not have fantastic frequencies because the combination of long lines into low density suburbs and low ridership mean that Justifying high frequencies is difficult, and since you need a driver on every single train, it's not inexpensive to operate service. Of course, there are cases where there are light rail systems that have sort of dedicated high quality corridors, like the Ottawa O-Train. But systems like that kind of skirt the line between regional rail and metro. If you have great corridors, why not build regional rail and get even more capacity? And if you don't have great corridors and you're gonna be building new ones, why not take the extra step and go with light metro? Now, of course, light rail can be made more attractive, but there is a flexibility tax, as I'll call it. Basically, the flexibility of light rail means that while it can do many things, it cannot do any one specific thing that well. Something that's been interesting to watch in Seattle is the development of the Link Light Rail over the years and how it's become more and more and more like the Vancouver Skytrain. While the Link Light Rail hasn't attracted a ton of ridership, and I'll be honest, it's not that large of a system, but still, per kilometer, it's not competitive with Skytrain, it's pretty interesting to see that Link is clearly trying to emulate Skytrain, but it's difficult because replicating Skytrain style infrastructure with light rail isn't actually that easy because the trains are larger, making the infrastructure more expensive. What that means is that as your light rail starts to become more and more like a light metro, it actually becomes less expensive to just build a proper light metro. Now, another option for suburbs could actually be massive BRT systems like we saw previously in Ottawa. I actually think that BRT is worse than light rail though in many ways. And the only reason I don't go talking about how BRT shouldn't be the backbone of your transit system is because honestly, it's just not as prominent in North America. 
for good reasons. BRT is really expensive to operate. It creates this sort of expectation in riders that every ride should be a one seat ride, which will mean that inevitably riders are disappointed when a transfer based system is implemented, which is basically inevitable. And perhaps worst of all, there's not a clear upgrade path for BRT. Now, if you actually look at where BRT is successful, it tends to be in places with really low labor costs, which isn't fantastic. As quality of life improves and labor costs increase, BRT systems become really, really expensive to operate, especially when you consider they have fairly low capacity compared to rail-based systems. And even if you could fully automate your buses, which you can't today, having a few big vehicles is better than having many small ones for efficiency reasons. Now, if I can impart anything on you in this video, it's that we really need to think more about operating costs, or OPEX, if you're cool, and the upgrade path for transit. Looking at operating costs, when operating costs are low, you can afford to run more service. More service attracts more riders. Of course, it also means that when you do need to cut service back because you have a global pandemic or another unforeseen event, you don't have to cut it back as aggressively. The Vancouver SkyTrain, despite us being in the pandemic, is still running headways every one, two or three minutes all day long. And that's because it just doesn't cost that much to run trains that don't have drivers. Now that really should be the goal in the long term, minimizing your costs per rider on transit. And that often means upgrading a corridor over time. You start with BRT and then you upgrade to rail. When you have rail, maybe you upgrade to automated rail or you upgrade to one person operation rail like you see in places like London. That said, having to upgrade a lot over time is not ideal because the process of upgrading, especially the spine of your transit network is painful and it's a risky process. If you mess up a major upgrade of your transit network, you could turn a lot of riders off and they might go and buy cars or move somewhere else and bike to work. So you really need to try to size your transit for the corridor it's on. Light Metro is good for so many of the reasons I've talked about in this video. Since it operates in a totally dedicated right of way, speed is only really restricted by your station spacing, how fast the vehicles can physically go, and the alignment that the vehicle takes. Frequency on new systems can also easily get up to close to 40 trains per hour, or up to 40 trains per hour if you design the system properly. If you're interested in a video in the future about how to design a rail system for high frequencies, leave a comment down below. Now what's really cool about automated metro is they take something that used to be really hard to get, which was this really skilled operations that you needed to operate a metro at high frequency. You had to have really good scheduling, you had to have really well-trained operators and the like, and it means that it's basically a turnkey system. Buy an automated metro, turn it on, set some parameters in software, monitor the system, and it operates at a high frequency. You don't need to train drivers to be superhuman like in Japan. You don't need to have this incredible scheduling ability like in Moscow. That's what makes automated metro especially just incredible. Of course, using high frequencies is so valuable, as I mentioned in my mini metros video, because it maximally utilizes your infrastructure. If you have giant stations and trains, but low frequencies, you're not getting a ton of value for your money. Of course, train lines that are large do have the benefit of you being able to grow into them over time, but I would argue that you should build transit lines to basically be at capacity, not a few years after they open, but not a century after they open. Because what that means is you're spending money in one corridor where you could be spending it on other corridors and building more transit that can be used today. Of course, since light metros have small trains, hence the light, they derive their capacity from this frequency. And what's great about that is that operators can't simply massively cut service because it will inevitably lead to overcrowding. You need to have a basic level of service frequency that tends to be pretty good. And that makes it easy for operators to make the right decision and the low cost decision of running lots of service. I'll also say that having super frequent transit is also just as beneficial as having just frequent transit. It's amazing coming from Vancouver to Toronto because I'll say the effect of moving from 30 minute frequencies on transit to 10 minute frequencies, while it is bigger than the move from 10 to three, you'd be surprised how big the move from 10 minute subway frequencies to three minute subway frequencies is. It's still substantial, especially if you have a large number of people using this system. Now, of course, Light Metro is great in suburban settings because you can put it almost anywhere you could put a median BRT or LRT line. Just throw up an elevated viaduct, or if you absolutely must, a cut and cover tunnel. Such guideways are even common in dense and high quality of life places like Singapore and Vancouver now. So it's not like the traditional L's of Chicago and New York that were loud and ugly to see. 
Being above ground helps you reduce costs in lots of ways. Some are obvious, some are less obvious. For example, being above ground lets you build faster, which costs less. It also helps you avoid a lot of utilities and other incursions into your route, which again, saves money. The small size of trains also helps reduce costs because your stations can be smaller, but they can also be more standardized because stations which are small have less risk of needing to work around obstacles and the like. So you can have a single station design or a few station designs that you use across an entire line with small customizations for a little more local character. This saves a ton of engineering, architecture, and design time, and time is money. One of the great things about the fact that we have a lot of light automated metro systems around the world now in places like France, Italy, Canada, and even in the United States now with Honolulu, though the system has its problems, is that there is a wide variety of pretty standardized stations to choose from, where you can say, let's do this station layout in this type of location and do this type of station layout in another location. The other big thing is that Metro can go much faster than buses or light rail, which is really important in low density areas where the distances between say, housing and work are much larger. Now you might say you can build a giant elevated guideway for light rail or yes, even buses, but I'm gonna be honest, especially building an elevated guideway for buses is totally nonsensical. You're paying most of the money for a full Metro, but you're getting the costs of a bus line. It just doesn't make sense. Light rail is slightly better, but still, the light rail trains needed to carry the same number of people as a proper metro train are often twice as long. And having trains that are twice as long not only means your stations have to be often twice as big, but you also need way more space to store trains and you have way more train that you need to maintain. So you can see that the capital cost or the cost to build a high capacity light rail system is not only higher, but so is the operating cost, which creates problems for eternity until you build a new line or use smaller vehicles which is not something you can really do. Now the obvious question one asks is, if automated light metro is so good, why haven't we built more of it? Now, I'd say there's a few reasons for this. For one, there are places that have built a lot of automated light systems, like Japan, China, France, Italy. But truth be told, a lot of places already had transit by the time that automated light metro systems started to really come of age. While the Vancouver Skytrain and the DLR developed in the 1980s and 1970s, it wasn't until I'd say the early 2000s that automated light metro was basically standardized and you could buy something off the shelf. By the early 2000s, a lot of places, particularly in North America, had already decided that light rail was the option for them. And because of a bit of a silly assumption that having different technologies in your transit system is bad and very inefficient, there's a certain pressure to not build lines with a different technology in the future, kind of trapping a lot of cities with a single technology that is really inefficient for all of their high capacity transit needs. So I'm gonna make a video about that in the future too. I've been planning it for a long time. So with all of that out of the way, automated light metro is a great solution for one, locations where great rail corridors don't already exist, two, places where distances are large, typically low density places, Three, service needs to be competitive and compelling when compared to car travel, especially in places like North America, that's important because if people can just get in a car and drive to their destination faster, it becomes a pretty compelling option, even if it is way more expensive. And four, doesn't trap you with high costs. The number of times I've seen a location install a new light rail or BRT system just to operate it at pitiful headways is incredibly frustrating. And that's one of the benefits of automated light metro. It makes it easier for you to make the right decision with your transit planning. You can have beautiful vehicles and stations, but if the trains and buses don't run often enough, no one's gonna wanna use them. So that's why I think automated light metro is great.